Before we begin our study today in Zen Buddhism and Hare Krishna and Mayar Baba, three exotic Eastern names which have penetrated our Western culture, shall we take a moment to look to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are told in thy word that Jesus Christ, thy Son, is the way, the truth, and the life. We are admonished in thy word to search the scriptures and to test all things and to hold fast to that which is good. We remember that thou hast promised that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And today we ask the blessing and the power of thy Holy Spirit upon the exposition of thy word as we contrast truth with error, even as thou hast commanded us. Bless us, protect us from the wicked one. Give us minds that think and hearts that will receive. And if there be any person who hears this, who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ and the glory of thy redemptive love, we pray that this may be the day that they find him as Redeemer and Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to direct your attention, if I may, before we begin our study of Zen Buddhism, which will be the first one we will be studying, to the Gospel according to St. Luke, to the words of Jesus Christ, Luke chapter 21. How many of you have your Bibles with you today? Good, we're going to need them. Luke chapter 21, Christ is speaking, and he makes this particular statement. And they asked him, saying, verse 7, Master, when shall these things be, and what sign shall will there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, Take heed that you be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draws near. Do not go, therefore, after them. Now, that's a very important verse. Take heed that you be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, or the anointed. The time is drawing near. Do not go after them. As we approach the study of these three cultic groups in the United States, and we define a cult as a group of individuals gathered around somebody's interpretation of the Bible, or in this particular case, of religious truth, it claims inevitably to be in accord with historic Christianity. But it always ends up by denying the centrality of the gospel message that Jesus Christ is incarnate deity. As I pointed out in the previous lectures on this subject, it's important to understand the reasoning processes of the Eastern mind. Why has there been such a tremendous penetration of American college campuses, of the so-called intellectual uh, barriers that have so far through the last 50 years been raised against historic Christianity? What has made these barriers fall down, so to speak, before imports from Asia? And I think that the reason that many of these things have taken place and the reason why people are responding is because there is a deep awareness of a need for spiritual reality. And a great many churches are not presenting Jesus Christ's gospel with a compelling relevancy. They are not attempting to really come to grips with the problems and issue of the day. And because of this, people are quite literally leaving the church in droves. Young people particularly are, if I may use the phrase, turning off on the gospel. Why? Because they've never really ever heard the gospel. And so when some organization comes along and says, now, if you meditate, you can reach reality. Or uh, if you concentrate on this particular type of thing, you can go on a type of spiritual trip, an experience that's going to transform your reasoning processes and your spiritual life. And then you take all of this oriental mysticism and this uh, paradoxical philosophy and you lightly spray it with Christian terminology and say, oh yes, we recognize Jesus. We recognize he is the great yoga or the great guru or the great prophet or a great manifestation or incarnation of divinity. And then you are very careful to cloak in Western terminology your Eastern philosophy or religion 
than young people who have no background whatsoever in historic Christianity are quite literally sucked into this like a huge vacuum cleaner because they are mistaking the terms and they're looking for reality, a quest for reality, for spiritual reality. And they go after these things en masse. I think this is not an oversimplification. I think it's a fact today. I think that people are going after all of these Eastern type religions in the United States because they've been dressed up to meet our cultural needs. But if we really want to deal with the problems of the East, we ought to go there and see what these religions have produced. If you really want to understand Zen, if you really want to understand Hinduism and Buddhism, if you really want to understand all of these sects and cults which have been imported into the United States, then go and look at what they have created over thousands of years in their own countries. They have kept the people enslaved in poverty. They have not taught values that enable individuals to help one another in their own society. They do not reach out to minister to the needs of others. In fact, you see the imitation of Christianity in non-Christian religions because it was Christianity that pioneered in the context of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Who is my neighbor? Why, he that needs me. Islam never, ever cared about its aged never ever cared about many of the social problems of the day. And yet today, the Red Cross is being imitated by the Red Crescent. Why? Because Christianity established a principle and Islam has followed it. If you go to Japan, you can hear a song being sung that's familiar to most Christians' ears. It sounds like, Jesus loved me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But if you know anything about Japanese, it's Buddha loves me, this I know. And there's an imitation of the methodology of Christianity. Not the content, but the methodology. In other words, pragmatically, something in Christianity works. The religions of the world and the cultic structures of the world recognize that. And what they're trying to do is to get hold of Christian terminology and pour their theology into the mold of our terminology and then to sell this terminology to the Western world. And they've been enormously successful in this particular sales approach. We also have to remember that there's a common denominator to these religious backgrounds, to Zen Buddhism, to Hare Krishna, and to Meher Baba, and to I Ching, and to all of these various systems. None of them believe in the existence of a personal God. None of them believe that we can address him as father. And all of them are off on some kind of a trip trying to establish a quest for truth, an identification with this unknowable essence or existence or divine mind, whatever the synonym may be. Now, if we're going to understand Zen Buddhism, we've got to understand that it's not a small operation. Let me just look at some of the facts concerning it. We know that Buddhism, as one of the major world religion, religions, uh, has a tremendous following. It has more than 153 million persons interested in its aspects of this religious philosophy or quest. Zen, which is in the United States is engineered and designed to appeal to the American mind. Today, Zen claims more than five million adherents in the United States and in Japan. And these are zealous promulgators of a philosophy which is attempting to bring man to nirvana. Now, what is this nirvana? What is the goal of Zen? We hear it all the time. Nirvana. It is reaching a state of enlightenment of the soul or spirit, whatever that may mean, until you are at last absorbed totally in the divine intellect. The Buddha attained this. This is the most desirable of all states. Now, Buddhism says that this is something in the future for the individual. But Zen Buddhism says that this can be the experience right now of any particular individual who becomes a devotee of this particular cult. It maintains that it's a here and a now possibility. 
Now, I think that we also have to recognize some other important things about Zen. It certainly is a religion which sees God as a reflection of man. Dr. Lit Sen Chang, who is professor at Gordon Divinity School, or Theological Seminary in Hamilton, Massachusetts, has described Zen as a former member of the cult and as now a devout Christian in the following terms. He tells us that Zen Buddhism's great weakness is that it tries to identify deity and nature and to identify man and God. In fact, Ogata, one of the great Zen writers in his book Zen for the West says, and I'm quoting, I see much common ground in Zen and the mysticism of Meister Eckhart. The eye by which I see God is the same eye by which God sees me. My eye and God's eye are one and the same. Now, what we are seeing here, of course, is the identification of man with God. But you see, we are lost in a maze of terminology. What do we mean when we talk about God? Can we talk about God as subject and object relationship, I and thou? Is this the way we talk about God? No. You don't talk about God in these religions this way. You can't talk about God as a person. You can use personal terms, but God is not a person. You are beholding God when you behold yourself because all of us, according to Zen, share in the nature of God. All creation shares in the nature of God. Zen is revolutionary. Enlightenment comes with clarification and simplification through acting out of all values of time and experience. What does it mean? It means that the individual's life is influenced in reality when the individual recognizes that he is part of God. And that you are looking at God when you are looking at you and the same eye that you see him with, he sees you with. Why? Because there's a unity of identity. Now, a great many people will say, well, what in the world does this have to do with the church of Jesus Christ? Why should we be concerned with Zen Buddhism? Well, we had better be concerned with Zen Buddhism because it is growing so rapidly in the United States and penetrating so many college campuses that the average Christian is running into this all the time. And the Christian says, I don't understand it. They talk about prayer. They talk about meditation. They talk about Jesus as being uh, a son of God. Why, uh, there must be some reality to what Zen is saying. And you know, there is. There is some reality to what Zen is saying. It is a reality that is grounded in us as human beings. It is not grounded in the Word of God and not grounded in divine revelation. It is certainly a means of trying to find peace, but it is not God's peace. Jesus Christ said, my peace I give you, not as the world gives, do I give you. The Zenists are looking for enlightenment. They call it Satori. They're looking for seeing into one's own nature, trying to understand and comprehend one's own nature. But the deeper you go into your own nature, the more rapidly you find out that the heart of man is deceitful above everything and incurably sick. Who can understand it? And you can sit cross-legged on the floor and contemplate stones and contemplate pools of water or spiders spinning webs and all of the other trappings of Zen concentration. And you are never, ever really going to understand what's wrong with you until you recognize that man fell from his state of fellowship with God in Eden and that that fall is not remedied by looking inside yourself. That, rem that fall is remedied by looking outside yourself to God who in Jesus Christ on the cross reconciled the world to himself. You see, in these Eastern cultic structures, everybody is looking within. In Christianity, God has us look out to the cross and to the resurrection. That is, 
our deliverance through faith in Jesus Christ. It was Dr. Carl Jung who, writing on the particular subject of Zen, made an interesting observation. I'd like to quote Dr. Jung because uh, very few people are aware of this penetrating analysis. Concerning Zen, he said, quote, We can never decide definitely whether a person is really enlightened or whether he merely imagines it. We have no criterion of this. Close quote. These words appear in the book An Introduction to Zen Buddhism by Suzuki, who is perhaps the greatest living authority on Zen Buddhism. Now, the Zenists tell us that if we follow it, it will open a third eye, that is, an eye into another dimension. Well, it might, but that dimension is not the dimension of God. The Scripture says that we fell in Adam and we have gone on sinning. Zen does not deal with the problem of sin. And nobody has a way of telling if they've ever reached enlightenment. It's purely subjective. A person may say, I have reached it. And somebody says to them, how do you know? Because I feel it. You see, what we are dealing with is emotion, feeling, and its influence upon the will. Now, anybody that knows anything about human experience knows that Dr. Jung is telling the truth. He is telling us, Look out for what you think and feel, because these are dangerous paths to travel. Somewhere along the line, there has to be objective authority. There has to be something we can ground our experience in. There must be a standard. And in these Eastern religious structures, we don't have a standard. What we have is every man his own personal divinity. Every man a spark from the divine flame. Every person in a quest for truth. Ever learning and seemingly never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. We ought to ask ourselves this question too. Has Zen Buddhism contributed to the sum total of man's development in any way? Has it brought forth any great missionary efforts into the world, established schools for the underprivileged, built orphanages, hospitals, homes for the aged, retirement homes? Has Zen come to grips with the social aspects of the cultures into which it has sent its missionaries? The answer is no, because it is primarily egocentric, which means that the Zenist is concerned first and foremost with himself. But the Lord Jesus Christ said this, that the greatest of all commandments, which is a refutation of Zen in itself, must be applied dramatically and personally for it to have any meaning. When he was asked, what is the great commandment, what did Jesus say? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, thy mind, and thy strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. Now, loving your neighbor as yourself is to do what for him? If he's hungry, feed him. If he needs clothes, clothe him. If he is needy in any way, minister to him. In effect, the Christian is commanded not only to preach Jesus Christ, but to minister in the name of Christ to a lost world. That's what the parables of Christ were all about. That's what the parable of the Good Samaritan is all about. Who is my neighbor? The person that needs me. When you are dealing with Zen and with Mer Baba and with Hare Krishna, you are dealing with people who could care less about the great social implications of the world. They are primarily concerned with Satori, with Nirvana, with their own pathway to desirelessness. It is a subjective religion, and it is, in essence, what is termed in theology, pantheism. That is, everything is part of God. But then nobody can define God. God is the great unknowable. And as Dr. Chang points out, since it denies God as a person and as knowable, quite obviously, it cannot sustain God as creator. And this, of course, is the foundation of everything 
that the Bible is built on. Genesis 1 begins with the statement, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. God personal, God creator. God as loving heavenly father. God as reconciler of the world in Jesus Christ. This Zen knows nothing about. And what Zen is looking for is a cosmic consciousness, but a consciousness apart from the God of the cosmos. They are not interested in a living Savior. They are not interested in dealing with the problem of sin. In fact, the Zenist is not interested in any way in coming to grips with the problem of sin as the Bible outlines it. I think it's interesting to note what the Zenist considers sin to be. Because unless we grasp the concept of sin, I don't believe it is possible for us in any way to really understand Zen. I'm quoting now from uh, Humphrey's book on Zen Buddhism when he says that sin is that which is contrary to moral law. To avoid sin and evil by obedience to any moral law is only an idle attempt, however. Every being must act according to the nature. There is no need of rules of morality. In other words, there are moral laws, but there is really no need for moral laws. There is reality in nature, capital N. You must act according to the nature of Zen. Therefore, you don't have to have any rules laid down for you. You can see that we are going in the proverbial circle. We are saying, yes, there is morality. Then we are saying it's not necessary to have laws of morality. And then we are saying, however, morality and sin are related, but this relation is very difficult to understand, so instead of trying to solve the problem, let's instead take the best possible way out. Ignore it. And this is precisely what the Eastern religions have been doing with sin for centuries. They have been ignoring it. The Hindus, by cyclic transmigration of the soul and trying to eradicate it by a continuous process of rebirth. The Buddhists, by following the Noble Eightfold Path and attaining desirelessness so that they no longer have any desire or lust or things that are going to create sin in their lives. But even sin has been redefined. When the Christian hears the word sin, it is transgression of the law of God. And all unrighteousness is sin. But when you deal with Zen, to avoid sin and evil by obedience to any moral law is only an idle attempt. Every being must act according to the nature. There is no need of rules of morality. Now, once we understand that Zen wants nothing to do with the character of God as the holy lawgiver, then we can understand why people are interested in it. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if you had a type of religious philosophy which gave you a type of peace in your mind in practically anything that you did? I know there are people who say, there isn't any peace outside of Jesus. Now, that's not the truth. There is. And Jesus said so. He said, my peace I give you, not as the world gives, I give you. The world gives a peace. There is a worldly peace. It can come through money. It can come through power. It can come from just being satisfied with one's own living, family, and culture. It can come through satisfaction in delusion of philosophy or religion. But there is peace in this world without God. But it is not peace with God. And it is not spiritual peace as God ordained it. Now you may be wondering, why is it so important that we deal with Zen in depth? Because if we don't, 
then people are going to be asking us questions for which we have no answers. They're going to be challenging the Christian faith with an alien philosophy rapidly growing, and we are going to have to answer by simply quoting Bible verses without really understanding the application of those verses. Now, if you look at your Bibles for a second, I think you'll notice something in 1 John chapter 1, verse 18, which cuts across the whole doctrine and core of Zen and virtually all of these Eastern religions. That would include Hare Krishna and Meher Baba. Notice that in 1 John 1, 18, we are told, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We are supposed to be dedicated to the pursuit of truth. We're supposed to recognize that sin is reality. And that if we say there is no sin, we ourselves have become victims of a grave delusion. Whosoever commits sin, 1 John 3, 4, whoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And he that practices sin is of the devil, verse 8, for the devil sins from the beginning. Jesus Christ was manifested to ruin the works of the devil. I think also that we could point out that the hallmark of relationship to God is Christian love. Whosoever truly loves God loves his brother. Look at verse 14 of 1 John 3. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brothers. He that does not love his brother is abiding in death. Now we have a pantheistic religion. We have a religion which is dedicated to egocentricity and attempting to solve the problem of sin on the basis of its own concept of morality and of evil and in direct contradiction to the scripture. There is a violation of the revelation of a personal God and of a God who creates and sustains all things. So the person who goes into Zen most of the time goes into it because there's a chance to be able to do whatever you want because you are the criterion for the activity. You don't have to measure up to what God says. You decide. It is the enlightenment you receive that enables you to make these decisions. I personally feel, in any analysis of Zen, that it's imperative to understand Zen's attitude toward Jesus Christ. Zen radically opposes the person of the Lord Jesus. They will not acknowledge him as the savior of mankind or acknowledge him as unique in the history of of the world. He is a manifestation at best of divinity, for Zen is essentially agnostic. Not that it will deny God, but that it will say it's impossible to have absolute knowledge or proof of God. So once we understand these things, I think it's possible for us as Christians to really face up to the challenge of Zen. Let me go just a few steps further before we move into Meher Baba, which is similar in a way to this. I think that in order to deal with Zen, we have to place it next to the scriptures. And in putting it next to the scripture, we should have a clear-cut refutation and a clear-cut answer from God's word. In Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39, Jesus Christ told us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, and our mind, and our neighbor as ourselves. In Zen, love is for the individual first, self-love. And then, it is not divine love which is shown to the world, for if it was, Zen would have created multiple works to testify to its philosophy. It has created nothing. Instead, Zen is a parasite 
as most structures are parasitical, that create nothing for society but draw everything from society. The ultimate goal of Zen Buddhism is the freeing of the will so that all things bubble along in one interrelated continual pattern. Those who would be disciples of Zen must allow their ego to be detached until one's real self calmly floats over the world's confusion. I'm quoting here so that we understand it. How are you supposed to float? Like a ping pong ball skirting over the troubled waters. What a magnificent picture. The world around us is a churning cesspool of depravity. And do we plunge into this with the gospel of Jesus Christ to bring men and women and young people to a redemptive knowledge of the Master and thus freedom from sin and power to walk with God? Or do we tell them that the ultimate in life is to so detach oneself from humanity and its concerns that you rise to the top of the cesspool and float along like the proverbial ping pong ball? Which really is both practical, meaningful, and that which will produce the most historically and in the contemporary world for mankind? Quite obviously, it's going to be the productive work of plunging in, preaching, living, answering, proclaiming, and seeing the power of the Holy Spirit touch the lives and the souls of people and bring them out of the cesspool of sin to glory and immortality and eternal life. Now, Zen's position is very clear. They maintain, quote, The real human tragedy began when nature was to be dominated by man. For when the idea of power, which is domination, comes in, all kinds of struggles arise. And again, the unconscious is thus the ultimate reality and the true form, close quote. That's fascinating. The unconscious is the ultimate reality and the true form. What is the ultimate goal? Absorption into the nirvana of a type of unconsciousness, undefined to be sure. This is what man is to seek for. When the scripture says that our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God. This is life eternal. In the 17th chapter of the Gospel according to John, if you check it in your Bible, I think you'll notice something else about what God has to say concerning his plans for us. He not only tells us in 1 John that we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, but he also tells us in John chapter 17, in the great prayer of the Lord Jesus, that something is going to be done and that this something is going to transform our lives not once but daily. What is this something? Well, look at it for just one second. Verse 3, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. Now, we pass over that very lightly, don't we? that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. We always forget the beginning of that verse. This is life eternal. There's your definition. This is life eternal. To know thee. To know thee. To know thee. How does one know God? One knows him in the forgiveness of sin. For he cannot have fellowship with us when we are lost in sin. It was for the purpose of freeing us from sin that Jesus Christ entered the world and died on Calvary. Therefore, the message is very clear. Zen, Nirbaba, and the other Eastern cults don't know him. They have no knowledge of him. They are agnostic, no knowledge. But Jesus Christ taught that to know him was life eternal. Conscious, personal fellowship with the Father, the Son, and through the ministry 
of the Holy Spirit. Now, one other thing I think that's important in dealing with Zen. We have to recognize that Zen is constantly trying to get people to reach a state of enlightenment through human wisdom and emphasis and meditation. But the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 5, that our faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Our faith should stand where? Not in human wisdom, not in the philosophy of men, but it should rest ultimately in the power of God. And I'm so glad that the Scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, that the weapons of our warfare against these forces are not carnal, but mighty through God, hurling down reasonings and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing all things into captivity. To who? To you and to me? No. That's what Zen would do. That's what these cultic structures would do. That's what the occult would do. Bring everything into captivity to you. But the scripture says... God will hurl all things down and bring them into captivity to Christ so that He may be all and in all. The fullness of Him that fills the church, which is His body. Zen, they tell us, is a sealed book. Indeed, it is a sealed book. But thank God that the Bible is not a sealed book. That the Bible is God's open book. And the Word of God is not bound. God's Word is still God's power that turns the hearts of men to salvation. If you're going to spend your life trying to look into your nature, you're going to be a very disgruntled and dissatisfied person. But if you're going to spend your life counting your nature dead because of Christ on the cross, and yourself resurrected because he lives at the right hand of God, then you can begin to appreciate the marvels of redeeming grace. Zen knows none of these things, and those who are immer immersed in it are people who have no real concept of fellowship with God. So 1 John 1, 1.8 is true. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. And when Zen says it has no sin, no transgression of God's law, when it has no atoning sacrifice, no reconciliation, no peace with God, we are dealing with that which is attempting to lift itself, proverbially, by its own bootstraps. Now, I think that hand in hand with any criticism of Zen is also the criticism of the fact that Zen does not understand that man is a fallen creature. That he was created initially good and became evil by choice. They are still acting as if it were possible for man to establish rapport with this unknowable deity. Ignoring the fact that we are alienated because of the fall, because of sin. In Adam all have died, says the Apostle. And by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. If we grasp this, we know that sitting cross-legged and contemplating is to do it with a fractured human nature and a nature which cannot reflect the glory of God. What we need is a recreation, not a reformation. For when the unclean spirit is gone out of man, then it wanders to and fro and returns from whence it came and finds the house cleaned and ready and then takes seven more unclean spirits and enters in so that the last estate of the man is worse than the first. The horror of Zen and Mer Baba and Hare Krishna and all of these autosoteric or self-salvation cults is that they are wide open 
to the possession of other forces. And the lives of men, the souls of men, become the slaves of whomever they yield to. Paul says, don't you know whoever you yield yourself servants to obey is servant you are? So says the word of God. Don't yield to these things. You become their slave. Incapable of freeing yourself. Instead, never mind Zen's meditation. Never mind the mystical and the denial of sin and the reality of cosmic judgment. Instead, look to him who bore all judgment in his own body on the tree. Now, one of the most rapidly growing groups in the United States, though it's small, is hand in hand with Zen in a number of ways. And this is Mayor Baba. As I often carry a great deal of documentation, it is necessary that in dealing with Mayor Baba that you have some documentation because nobody would believe you when you started to quote Mayor Baba. Now, some people are going to say, well, what in the world is Mayor Baba? And why is it important? And why should we get all uptight about it? I think the reason why we ought to get uptight about Mayor Baba is because so many people are interested in it, particularly young people on university campuses. I have had more inquiries on Mayor Baba in the last six months than I have had on it in the last five years, which means that people are getting concerned with it. Now, what is it? Well, Mayor Baba, and I have here a newspaper which headlines Mayor Baba Passes, which means that he has died. Mayor Baba is the name for Merwan Shariar Irani, a Persian who was born in Pune, India in 1894 and died in 1969. He was influenced by Sufism and he claimed to be God. He claimed that he was a reincarnation of Buddha, Krishna, Zoroaster, Jesus Christ, and Mohammed. His chief works are his discourses, a five-volume work, and the book God Speaks. He gave various darshans or audiences, which are equivalent to papal audiences, in which his followers came to receive communications from him. And the main center of the operation in the United States is in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. In 1925, Mayor Baba took a vow of silence and never spoke a word from 1925 to 1969. Forty-four years, the world was without his voice, and he passed on. Uh, he maintained that the people weren't listening to him, and therefore he was not going to speak. Uh, he had some rich sponsors in the United States, and his group did not begin to grow until after his death. He is regarded by his followers as the Christ and as the Messiah of this present age. I'm quoting now also uh, from Mayor Baba, who said, I am not this body. Remember this. And then he told one of his disciples outright that he would leave his body just a few days before he did so. On January 30th, he told the doctor, my time has come. And the next morning, only a few hours before he passed away, he gestured, today is my crucifixion. And he died. Now, you might say, well, this obscure Indian mystic can't really concern us. Why are we worried about Mer Baba? We are worried because, Mer Baba said, I am the divine beloved who loves you more than you can ever love yourself. And because Mayor Baba has convinced a goodly segment of people in the United States and an ever-growing segment of people that he really was a supernatural being and by predicting his death and a number of other things that he is to be revered and worshipped as an incarnation of divinity for our time. Now, in order for us to deal with his theology and I don't want to spend a great deal of time on it, I think the best thing to do is to let Mir Baba speak for himself. I'm going to quote from one of his writings, Existence is Substance and Life is Shadow, which was delivered on March 1st, 1954. 
Uh, Mir Baba also uh, wrote many other things. I just haven't got the time to go into all of them. But he has attracted a considerable following. And you will notice something in the vocabulary. You will notice that the Eastern mind is almost a total stranger many times to Aristotelian logic. That is, to reason from premises through steps to a conclusion. The Eastern mind seldom cares about the law of non-contradiction, which is that A cannot at the same time be non-A. Now, some person listening to me may say, what in the world are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about a very simple thing. If A equals water and it's wet, then water, which is wet by definition, cannot be non-wet at the same time. A is not non-A, ever. It cannot be a wet, dry, light, dark day outside simultaneously, because if it is, you need help, or the weatherman desperately needs some new laws for describing the phenomena of weather. But all of us recognize that things are what they are by definition, and the moment we lose track of vocabulary in context and terminology, we've lost track of all communication. You can write anything that you want and say anything that you want. And you can say God, and it can mean roast beef sandwich, if you don't define that term. This is what Zen does. This is what Mir Baba did. This is what Hare Krishna does. This is what all of these Eastern cultic structures do. They redefine the words. And if you don't know, it sounds wonderful until you find out what's being said. So for a little exercise in semantics, I'm going to quote from Mir Baba so you'll understand. Point two, and it's important. The Eastern mind operates on paradox and contradiction, not on Aristotelian premises. So don't expect to have a valid conclusion all the time. In fact, be surprised sometimes if you ever get one. Expect the unexpected and you'll not be disappointed. In fact, one of the maxims which I often use in dealing with the Eastern cultic religions is, Blessed is he that expecteth nothing, for he shall not be disappointed. Mir Baba, quote, Come all unto me, this is from Mir Baba's call. Although because of the veil of illusion, this call of the Ancient One may appear as a voice in the wilderness, its echo and re-echo nevertheless pervades through time and space to rouse at first a few and eventually millions from their deep slumber of ignorance. The time is come. I repeat the call and bid all come unto me. Close quote. Of course, the direct contrast to this particular verse is rather apparent. And this is Mary Baba's verse. It is found in Scripture. Jesus Christ said, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Mir Baba is saying, uh, almost 2,000 years later, I am issuing the call. Come to me. The answer of the Christian is Luke chapter 21. There will be false Christs. Go not after them. Many shall arise in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. The scripture has given us ample warning. Mohammed followed him, and through the ages, many more like him. Mir Baba really believed he was an incarnation of divinity. Now let's listen to some of his theology. God is all. God knows all. God does all. When the avatar proclaims he is the ancient one, that's Mir Baba, it is God who proclaims his manifestation on earth. When man utters for or against the avatarhood, it is God who speaks through him. It is God alone who declares himself to the avatar and mankind. I tell you with all my divine authority that you and I are not we, but one. There is nothing but God. He is the only reality. We all are one in the indivisible oneness of this absolute reality. 
And when the one who has realized God says, I am God, you are God, and we are all one, close quote. Now, I think it's rather clear here that we are getting Hinduism, that all of us share in the divine nature, that we cannot say we, we must say I, because all of us share in God. And so Mayor Baba's claim to be God is based upon what? The fact that everybody shares in divinity. You say, well, that's pretty far out stuff. And that's Eastern religion. We don't really have to worry too much about that. Well, you better worry because you've got Herbert W. Armstrong and the Radio Church of God or the World Church of God right down here in Pasadena. And that's one of the main tenets of Herbert Armstrong's religion. That you can become God. Direct quotation, virtually. And he borrowed this from the Mormons, who in turn borrowed this from the Hindus. There is nothing but God. He is the only reality. Indeed, then God must be terribly evil or schizophrenic. Because it is apparent that there is a vast amount of non-good running around the world. And I would like to take Meher Baba and his followers over to Dachau, Auschwitz, Buchenwald, and Ravensbrück and let them look at the graveyard of six million people and have them mouth this kind of philosophic nonsense to their relatives. What in the world will men think of? There is nothing but God. He is the only reality. And God is all. God knows all. God does all. And all is good. He is the only reality. Oh, if he's the only reality, he's responsible for those monstrous things over there in Germany. And the scripture says that he is not. That Satan is responsible. And this brings us to an important point. Mer Baba and Zen and Hare Krishna and I Ching and all of these cultic structures are strangely silent about the existence of the Prince of Darkness. It appears as if they are content to talk about God all the time. However, they define him. But not about the devil, of whom Jesus Christ said, he is the ruler of this age. And Paul says, the God of this world. We are told that we're in warfare against him. Ephesians chapter 6 against the spiritual rulers of the darkness of this age, wickedness enthroned in heavenly places. When we bring Zen together with this, we can see a type of unity. They're both pantheistic. They are both claiming unity with some kind of unknowable nature. And they are both using Hindu philosophical terms because Buddhism was derived from Hinduism. Buddha being a convert from that particular structure. I am God, you are God. We are all one. The moment we accept this, we have to acknowledge that God is the source of evil. And at that particular juncture, we have destroyed the revelation of God given by Jesus Christ. Certainly the revelation of the Bible. Now on existence is substance and life shadow, Mir Baba said, quote, existence is eternal, life is perishable. Existence is what his body is to man, and life is as the cloth that covers the body. The same body changes clothes according to the seasons, times, and circumstances, just as the one and eternal existence is always there throughout the countless and varied aspects of life. In eternity, nothing has ever happened, and nothing will ever happen. That's a fascinating statement. Isn't it? In eternity, nothing has ever happened. Nothing will ever happen. But you know, in eternity, the angels were created. In eternity, God thought of all creation. And the moment God began to think of creation, granting that he is an eternal mind, there were events in sequence. And sequential thought is happening. Therefore, what we are dealing with, quite obviously, 
is the fact that because the mind of God exists in eternity, he could see time in eternity. And because time existed in his mind in eternity, there is such a thing as sequential events and there is such a thing as happening in eternity. And I'm happy to say that the Bible teaches that when we enter the new Jerusalem, there will be happenings. And that when we enter the presence of Jesus Christ, we who will have overcome by his blood and will sit with him in his throne. That's a happening. And there are lots of other happenings too. Chief among them is that we shall judge the angels, among whom is Satan, the adversary of our souls. So when Mir Baba says, in eternity nothing has ever happened and nothing ever will, it's obvious that he has no knowledge of the God of the Bible. Existence is God. Life is illusion. Existence is reality. Life is imagination. Existence is everlasting. Life is ephemeral. Existence is unchangeable. Life is ever-changing. Existence is freedom. Life is binding. Existence is indivisible. Life is multiple. Existence is imperceptible. Life is deceptive. Existence is independent. Life is dependent on mind, energy, and gross forms. Existence is... You like that phrase, I trust. Existence is. I don't know how it could be other than that. Because the moment you say existence, you postulate what? Existence. It has to be in order to say it. Whereas life appears to be. Existence, therefore, is not life. Here's a very important point. Life appears to be. No, it doesn't. Life doesn't appear to be. Life is real. Just as real as what he's talking about in existence. Why? Because Christ said so. He said, I have come that they may have existence and that they may have it more abundantly. Is that what Jesus said? Oh, no. I have come that they may have life. They may have it more abundantly. And this is existence eternal. No. This is life eternal. That they may know thee, the only true God. So we're dealing with what? We're dealing with confusion of terms. Notice how existence is defined. Existence, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present God, even the very fact of its being does not touch existence. Do you understand that statement? That's a fascinating statement. I'll quote it again. Even the very fact of its being does not touch existence. I, I don't understand it. Maybe you do. But it appears to me that a fact is something which is empirically verifiable. So if I empirically verify the fact of existence, I have to acknowledge its very fact and that it touches existence. But apparently we don't have that problem with Mir Baba because he doesn't believe in the existence of the material world. This is illusory. For he tells us that life appears to be and it is deceptive. And finally... He says, simply to desist from committing actions will never put an end to actions. To escape from actions is not the remedy of, for the uprooting of actions. Only actions can nullify actions. Now listen carefully. Karma yoga, dhyan yoga, raj yoga, and bhakti yoga serve the purpose of being prominent signposts on the path of truth. Jesus of Nazareth said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And then he said, those who do surrender their all, mind, body, possessions, so that with their complete surrender, they also surrender consciously their own self to the perfect master, to the perfect yoga, yet have their very being left conscious to commit actions activated now only by the dictates of the master. The perfect master's invariable counsel is complete surrender to him. So what are you supposed to do in Mir Baba? Completely and totally surrender to him. And what is the command of the Lord Jesus Christ? That we are to be born again into his kingdom 
through the Holy Spirit and that our lives are to become living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. You see, the ultimate goal of life is not happiness. The ultimate goal of life, according to Scripture, is the service of God and our fellow man. Happiness is a byproduct of that service. And as we serve Him with joy and dedicate ourselves to Him, then it is fulfilled within us that the fruit of God's Spirit manifests itself. His love, His joy, His long-suffering, His goodness, His temperance, His meekness, His faith, these fruits come out of us. These are the things which reflect the fact that we have surrendered to Christ. The surest proof that you are surrendered to Christ is that the fruit of the Spirit emerges from your life. And if there's no love in your life and no joy and no peace, if the fruits are not there, then don't talk about surrender to Christ. Mayor Baba says, surrender to me and to the dictates of the Master. Jesus said, present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And Mayor Baba closes by saying, I have emphasized in the past, I tell you now, I shall age after age forevermore repeat that you shed your cloak of life and realize existence which is eternally yours. To realize this truth of unchangeable, indivisible, all-pervading existence, the simplest way is to surrender to me completely. So completely that you are not even conscious of your surrender. Conscious only to obey me and to act as when I order you to. Close quote. This is why there is such devotion in this cult. Because it is the worship of an individual and the recognition that he is the incarnation of divinity for our time. Similar to Baha'ism, which maintains that Bahu'u'llah is a manifestation for our time. This cult has absorbed the minds of young people for a very good reason. It has absorbed the mind because it is trying to fill the emptiness of the human spirit. Man must have the worship of God. And when he exchanges the worship of God for idols, then we see the depravity of Romans 1 and the horror of cosmic judgment. Mir Baba is one more example of the certainty of that judgment. It is for these people in Zen and in Mir Baba that the church must have a burden. Those who are lost and bound, taken captive by Satan at his will. It is for them that we must have the love of Christ. It is to them that we must reach out. It is for them that Jesus died and rose again. We cannot ignore this mission field. We dare not disobey our master, who said, go into all the world and disciple all peoples. To begin our study of uh, Hare Krishna, which is a derivative of Hinduism, uh, Hindu cultic structure, with the words of Jesus Christ as found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Do not be like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. When you pray, Jesus said, verse 6, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. Across the United States, and for that matter around the world, we see the spectacle of groups of young people with saffron robes and shaved heads, except for a, a pigtail, the boys at least, going out and chanting uh, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Hare and with uh, tambourines and uh, begging bowls and with literature, selling literature and trying to promote the religion of Hare Krishna. 
And this has caught on in the United States. It's caught on many college campuses. Uh, in every major city in the United States, we have groups like this going about promulgating these particular views. And it seems to have entered in places where Christianity has not been able to successfully penetrate, and a great many people are disturbed about it. Therefore, an analysis of it is mandatory. Now, fortunately, when we undertake any study of Hare Krishna, we begin with an understanding that it is not a religion which had its origin in the United States, such as Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormonism, but that the Krishna movement came from India as an offshoot of Hinduism and actually is characterized by its chief representatives in the United States as a top system of yoga. They emphasize a vegetarian diet. They have taken over many of the postulates of classical Hinduism. And what we are seeing is a westernized transplant of the Krishna cult from India to the United States. There's an interesting statement made by one of the principal representatives of the Hare Krishna movement in the United States, which is A.C. Bhaktivedanta, in the book Krishna, the Reservoir of Pleasure and other essays. He says, quote, it is not a very good condition when the young generation, which is the future hope of the country, feels that there is no hope. Their future is dark. Why? Because they have no direction. What is the aim of life? What will they become? Their philosophy is work hard, get dollars, and enjoy as you like. This is misguidance. That cannot give total satisfaction. Close quote. Now, of course, we would be in agreement that if the aim of life is pure materialism, get the dollars, do what you want, of course this can't give total satisfaction. But neither can donning a saffron robe and standing on a street corner, jumping up and down and smiling at individuals passing by and hawking literature with uh, uh, a deep sense of sincerity to be sure, grant you any more peace of mind or productivity. And this is what we are faced with in the Krishna movement today. As we approach it, we cannot help but think of the words of the Lord Jesus. He said, do not use empty repetitions. And precisely the prayer that the Krishna representative uses is a constant repetition. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Hare. What we are seeing is a constant type of auto-hypnosis in which the person is actually self-hypnotized into a feeling of well-being. But as has been often said by competent psychologists, what can be induced by suggestion can be removed by suggestion. And if you have a benevolent state of mind simply because you happen to have gotten there through self-hypnosis and suggestion, then that benevolent state of mind can disappear uh, supplanted by another state of mind, which may not be healthy or benevolent. And there are a number of individuals that have already been delivered from the Krishna movement who can testify to this. In the Krishna Consciousness book by the same author, the Krishna movement is called, quote, the topmost yoga system, close quote. And we are specifically told on page 49, quote, those who are non-devotees cannot explain the science of God, close quote. And this raises the all-important question when we get into the heart of the Hare Krishna movement, what do they mean when they talk about God? Well, Krishna is reputedly a manifestation of divinity and that he is one of the 388 million gods and goddesses of the Hindu pantheon. I'll never forget at Christian Research Institute, not too long ago, receiving a card from an individual that said, Merry Krishna, not Merry Christmas. And then the person sent a letter in and said the trouble with us at Christian Research Institute and the trouble with Christians was that they didn't realize that all of the things that we claim for Jesus of Nazareth, that Krishna, the great Hindu God, had accomplished long before Jesus Christ was born. Then he proceeded to list these things and that told us that Krishna was virgin born, that he lived a sinless life, that he worked miracles, that he died on a cross and that he rose from the dead. 
And uh, the moment I saw this, of course, I recognized it for what it was. And I turned to some of our research men on the staff and I said, um, I think what we had better do is a thorough research on this Krishna doctrine. So we'll be able to answer questions when they come up because this thing is going to start mushrooming. And it certainly did right after that. But the truth of the matter is this, that all of the statements made about Krishna, that he was virgin born, that he had a sinless life, that he died on a cross, that he rose from the dead, that he claimed to be incarnate deity and so forth, and the attempt to parallel this with Christianity as if Jesus Christ's disciples and apostles copied this material from Hindu sources utterly disintegrates when you find out that none of these references to Krishna and his particular abilities appear before the first century. In other words, who copied from who? The answer is pretty clear. The Krishna people copied from the New Testament and then tried to say because Hinduism was older, therefore Krishna, of course, preceded Jesus. Well, Krishna may have preceded Jesus in time. But all of the material included in the New Testament is not descriptive of Krishna. And so when a Hare Krishna person comes and says, well, Krishna did all of these things you Christians are talking about and says, Merry Krishna and all the rest of it to you, then it's a good moment to say, uh, when was the earliest time that you can trace back these references to Krishna? And they'll say, uh, oh, well, uh, uh, well, they always were. And the answer is no, they weren't always. None of them goes below the first century. So the copying was done by the Hindu cult. It was not done by Christianity. The claim, therefore, is a totally invalid claim. Those who are non-devotees, we are told, cannot explain the science of God. What do we mean by God? Well, we mean the Hindu concept of God. And the Hindu concept of God is that God is everything and in everybody. You see how we are back to Zen and we are back to Mer Baba and we are back to all of these structured cultic things from the ancient world religions. There may be fragmentations of them broken off from the various religious structures, but they're all saying essentially the same thing. We are all part of God from the Greek pantheism or all God. And people are sucked into the Hare Krishna movement because they think that it's going to give them some kind of peace. Well, the only kind of peace is a self-hypnosis and the very real possibility of being controlled by forces other than God. Now, we have to also recognize that for the Krishna people, that Krishna appears in everything. Krishna appears in wood. Krishna appears in Glass, Krishna appears in iron, Krishna appears in all kinds of material objects. And just as the Hindus do, the Krishna people venerate these types of objects and can indeed venerate various things because they believe they are manifestations of the world soul or of this divine mind. When you get into Hinduism, you find out that the three, three chief gods, Brahm, Vishnu and Siva, all manifest themselves in various ways. And as you go into the structure of Hinduism, you will find out that these 388 million gods and goddesses are all manifestations, all forms of divinity. And when you deal with Krishna and the Hare Krishna movement, please understand at the very outset you are dealing with Hinduism. And once you do a little reading on Hinduism, you will radically come to the conclusion that whatever we are dealing with, we are surely not dealing with the God of the Bible. And that the Hare Krishna movement cannot be in any way compatible with biblical Christianity. Now what they are looking for, they tell us, is to attain maya, which is a detachment, if I am quoting properly, of the soul from the real self. In other words, what you are trying to do is attain some exalted state in which you will be able to meditate, able to communicate with this infinite essence. And when you recognize that the Krishna movement is based upon Hindu principles, when you recognize that they are not offering salvation to the individual so far as personal redemption from sin is concerned, 
when you recognize that they do not in any way acknowledge Jesus Christ as uniquely the Savior of lost men, it is at that point that you understand Krishna consciousness and that you can come to grips with the fact that Krishna and its devotees is a dangerous perversion, not only of Hinduism, but a dangerous perversion of basic philosophical truth. Namely, that all men are seeking for wisdom and for knowledge. And that once you state that you have arrived at this wisdom or knowledge, by a transcendental route, that is, seeking it outside of yourself, purely subconsciously, without any divine revelation, that you can measure, that you can test. Once you acknowledge this, you are thrown into a world of subjectivism in which anything can be true simply because nobody is in a position to tell you that it's false. I don't know how many can remember reading uh, Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. But if you remember Alice in Wonderland, you will recall that going through the mirror radically changed things. In other words, it was possible for all kinds of things that were considered normal to have reversed meaning. This is the way it is going through the mirror of Hare Krishna. What we would call God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in Christianity becomes in reality the Hindu concept of God, an impersonal deity. What we would call Jesus Christ, God's Son, becomes Krishna, Son of God, and a complete offspring of a pagan divinity, not at all resembling the Christ of New Testament revelation. When we are talking about redemption, we are not talking about the vicarious atonement of Christ, where he bore in his own body our sins upon the tree, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the payment for our sins resting on him, and being healed by his stripes. We're not talking about that in Krishna. You are expiating your sins in the Krishna movement, not by the blood of Jesus Christ, but in the traditional Hindu methodology. We also have to face the fact that there are the normal Hindu trappings that go along with Hare Krishna. They have prayer beads. They have what is the equivalent of a rosary, which they carry in a little white bag. And they even have a special kind of white clay, which is flown in directly from India. At their services, which are called kirtans, they sing Indian hymns, and you have to remove your shoes when you are attending these because shoes are made of leather. And, of course, Hinduism does not permit the butcher of animals because if you kill a cow, you might be assassinating Aunt Mary or Cousin Willie or someone else because of the doctrine of the transmigration of the soul. Now, if you want to really extrapolate this further, I suggest that you visit India and see what these religions have produced. I'm always saying, if you want to see what the religions they are trying to export to us are worth, then go to the places that are doing the exporting and take a look at what the product did for the people. If you go into the temple of the Jains in Calcutta, for instance, you will see a mother and a father sitting on the floor of the temple praying, and you will see lice on the floor, and the lice will be jumping on and off their bodies and on and off the bodies of their children. And the parent will reach down and remove these despicable things and carefully so as not to hurt the louse, put it on the floor. Not to kill it, but not to in any way injure it. Because you see, this might be the repository of an immortal soul in progress of transmigration. When you go to India and you see the Indian holy men and the fakirs walking along in the streets and a fresh pile of cow dung is there and they take the cow dung and smear it in their hair because this is a high acknowledgement of the sacred cow. 
then one comes to the realization that what we are dealing with is a religious structure which enslaves the minds and the souls of people that does not set them free. It took Mohandas Gandhi to break the caste system of India. And it ended up costing him his life by the time he was finished. Hinduism is not a benevolent religion and never was. Its temples proclaim it. And if you go to the temple of Kali in Calcutta, the goddess of death and destruction, and look at the fertility rites which go on there, and then compare these fertility rites with what the New Testament is teaching and what the gospel is teaching, and you'll recognize that all of these gods and goddesses are interbound in Hindu theology so that you cannot separate Krishna from Kali in the end because the oneness of God demands the unity of all gods and goddesses. Then it is that you recognize that the saffron robes and the chanting and the apparently clean scrubbed appearance of this form of Hinduism in the United States is all the more deadly because it does not accurately represent the product of the religion at home. Now, I am not criticizing India as a nation because India as a nation has come a long way in the last few years. Nor am I criticizing people because they have strong devotion to their religion. What I am criticizing in the name of Jesus Christ's gospel is the idea that Hare Krishna is in any way compatible with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are saying that it is, and the church must say, absolutely, incontrovertibly, no. Never will they be compatible. Because we are not dealing with the God of the Bible. And we are not dealing with the Savior. And Krishna didn't die on the cross for our sins and didn't rise from the grave the third day. This is all mythology which grew up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years post facto. We are dealing with Jesus Christ's gospel. These things, the scripture says, were not done in a corner and they were all recorded within the lifetime of the apostles. People could have challenged all the things which were said, but nobody challenged them. And they didn't challenge them because these things had occurred and they were known to people throughout that part of the world. Now, there are Hare Krishna centers throughout the United States. We have them in San Francisco and Washington, D.C. and New York. Los Angeles has them. They are all over the world. England, Australia, Canada, Japan, you name it. And they are growing. And people are interested in Krishna consciousness, attaining unity with the Lord Krishna. Now, the Bible tells us there's only one Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. For though there be those that are called lords in heaven and earth, lords many and gods many. For us there is one God the Father, one Lord, Jesus Christ. There's no Lord Krishna. There's a Lord Christ. And the Christian recognizes this as the logical fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. When we understand it, we have to ask the question, what does the Krishna movement produce? And I would like to put it in these terms so we won't mistake it. The Krishna movement produces a parasitical form of religion. It does not produce enduring commitment to the betterment of mankind. I was walking near my church in New York City not too long ago. As I passed by a theater when it was letting out, the Krishna people were standing there with their literature, hopping up and down and chanting Hare Krishna. One of them hopped over to me as I was passing by because I stopped for a moment to look at them. And uh, he said to me, you look like a very intellectual man, sir. Would you like to buy a book that addresses the intellect? And he handed me a Krishna book. And I said, no, not really. I said, I would like to ask a question, though. Yes, sir. I said, why don't you, instead of hopping up and down and smiling at everybody and passing out literature and chanting Hare Krishna, why don't you go down into the ghettos and uh, try and work with the people down there who need help? Why don't you go out and raise money for the people who need clothing and food in the ghettos? 
why don't you put some social impact to your religious philosophy and try and practice what you say is in accord with Christianity. That's what Jesus Christ taught. He wheeled on his toe and walked away from me without one single comment. The answer, of course, was obvious. They are not interested in communicating to the culture anything meaningful in the United States any more than they were in India. They will take from this culture, they will give nothing to it. It is basically an egocentric religion, as is Zen and Merbaba, where one spends his time in the happiness of contemplation. I think perhaps some of these people could sit on the front porch and watch a cobra devour an infant and could objectively state that the cobra, after all, was entitled to its point of view. I think this is what our world has come to, that men can look at the face of evil and sickness and disease and suffering and the inequality that exists in our world and rather than go out in the name of God to change these things, put on robes, take tambourines, and bounce up and down with semi-hypnotic smiles on their faces, telling the world that the way to ultimate realization and happiness is to be lost in a Krishna consciousness. This is not practical religion. Pure religion, the scripture says, and undefiled before God, is quite different. It is care for the needs of those who have no one to care for them and concern for the orphans. This is missing in India. It is the Western world that has cared, not the Eastern world. And as Dr. Oz Guinness has pointed out in his interesting lecture, The East, No Exit, what has the East offered the West? It has offered us no exit for thousands of years. Only Jesus Christ emerged, not with a Western religion, but with a Middle Eastern religion, and brought to us a message of hope that God loved the world and sent his Son to be its Savior. Perhaps the words of the Apostle Paul are more than fitting to close with. He tells us in Colossians chapter 1, we are to give thanks to the Father who has made it possible for us to be inheritors with the saints in light, who has translated us from the authority of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sin. It is this forgiveness of sin we wish for Zenists, for those who follow Mer Baba, and for those who are entrapped in Hare Krishna, that they may find Jesus Christ, the ultimate, the ultimate trip of the soul, a trip that never ends, because he and he alone lives after the power of endless life.